just remind ourselves what the average truncated shift operators look like just for Christoph's benefit because he wasn't here. These operators here are dyadic shift operators with a function k which is just a linear combination of half functions at smaller scales. We average it over the choice of dyadic system and we get something that's bounded on LP and we'll also get something that's translation invariant and also should have the right kind of dilation invariance that'll give you truncated Hilbert transforms. Problem is truncated Hilbert transforms don't have a nice characterization by their symmetries that the Hilbert transform has. So we do need to explicitly compute this operator and see that it gives us truncated Hilbert transforms and it, it will. Also there'll be error terms. So this isn't exactly a truncated Hilbert transform but it is a truncated Hilbert transform up to another bounded operator. So everything's gonna work out fine. Let's start computing with a proposition. X is UMD, P is between one and infinity, standard assumptions, blah, blah, blah. Nu is a probability measure on the interval from one to two. K is an admissible base function, just to get all of the setup right. Okay. So for all F in LP, for all scales M less than or equal to N, your average truncated dyadic shift operator is actually by a miracle. It's an integral from two to the minus n to two to the minus m. The new tilde, now there's a few things I have to define. I'll define them after I write out the equality. Integrating with respect to a new measure, new tilde. Function phi sub k, whatever that is, dilated by t in L1 sense, convolved with f. All right. So this average truncated shifts are actually integrals of convolution operators. In fact, you can put the integral inside the convolution and say that this is actually a convolution operator, but we're not gonna do that. So let me just make all the definitions. New tilde is the measure on the positive real line such that new tilde of A is equal to new of two to the minus J A if A is contained in the interval from two to the J, two to the J plus one. So new tilde is just a multiplicative extension of new. New was defined from one to two, and you can just multiply that out to get all of the positive reals. This multiplicative extension is new tilde. The function phi superscript K that's involved in this, this convolving function here is the integral of the admissible base function K x plus u against the half function h on the unit interval du. So this is also pretty much a convolution of k with h, although it's actually the reflection of k, reflection, I forget, but you know, essentially a convolution of k with h. And phi kt of x is t to the minus one phi of x divided by t for all t greater than zero. So before I use the notation dil for dilation, but that was an L2 normalized dilation. This here is an L1 normalized dilation. So it preserves L1 norms. I think I've now defined everything. I should say this is for all X in R. That all good? At least the statement of this proposition. It says that your average dyadic average truncated dyadic shift is actually basically a convolution operator. And the convolvers are given like that. These can be computed explicitly for specific k's, and we're gonna do that. But first I've got to prove this. So first let's compute this, let's compute so we have this average in the average, average dyadic shift. We have the average over omega and the average over t. Let's first just do omega. And let's take the intervals in the generalized dyadic system, but just at a fixed scale j. So we're fixing t and j for this computation for the moment. This was the definition of the dyadic shift operator, at least restricted to scale j. And so we're averaging omega. Let's see what this is. We have X in R, we have T between one and two, J is an integer. So first we note that the interval I being in this part of the shifted 
dilated dyadic system can be written like this. It's two to the minus JT times an interval uh, from S to S plus one. So this is for some, did I write what S was? So we're gonna look at all S's in the integers. So we take the interval from S to S plus one, and then we add this extra parameter omega superscript J, depending on omega. And remember that omega superscript J is the sum of I greater than J of two to the minus I omega I. Is that right? Am I wrong? I think this is right. I defined this in the previous lecture. Oh, I've got it written in my notes. Sorry, I'm actually wrong. <laughs> two to the j minus i, omega i, so that this number is actually between zero and one. Remember that? Okay. So this is just parameterizing the, the dyadic intervals that are shifted by this parameter omega. Of course, we just have standard unit length intervals here at in, with integer endpoints. We translate that by some number between the two endpoints and then we dilate it out to be the right scale. And your intervals have these forms. So let's take, let's call this star so I don't have to write it again. The star is the integral over this probability space. Let's write this as a sum over integer s. And let's write out what i is painfully, two to the jt. I'm gonna write this just for convenience as zero, one plus s plus omega j of x, then we have f, h, the same thing as before. D omega, writing out a space there. And how would we compute this? Well, the key observation here is that this omega j is actually uniformly distributed in the interval zero one, as omega varies over this probability space. I probably should have proved this. I felt like this was obvious from the definition. Uh, omega j is just a number with binary expansion given by these omega i's for i greater than j. And each of these omega i's is independent. It's either zero or one. And if you take random binary expansions in this way, you just get the unit interval uniformly distributed. Maybe I should have proved it, but I'm just gonna call that obvious. I'm sorry, it's not, it's not actually obvious, but I'm gonna call it obvious. And because of this uniform distribution, this average over omega here, we can just do a change of variables and say, this is the integral from zero to one with everything as before. Du, where u is going from zero to one. And then we just write out the interval as before, but now this omega j is u. unit interval plus s plus u, du. Does that make sense? At least if you take for granted that this omega j is uniformly distributed in the unit interval, you can reparameterize everything. These integrals only depend on the distribution of these random variables. Good. Now we have these two s plus u terms. s is varying over the integers, u is varying over the unit interval. So this is just an integral over the real line written in a confusing form. So we can write that as the integral over R, no sum anymore, two to the JT unit interval plus, let's call this DV. V is now S plus U for the appropriate S's and U's. And let's just write this as the integral from V to V plus one, because that's what it is in the end. Two to the JT, V, V plus one. DV. So it's already getting quite a bit simpler. The shifted dyadic systems are gone. This is where the translation invariance truly comes in, this part of the computation. And what can we do now? Let's write out that Haar coefficients is just an integral of f against this Haar function. We write out all the integrals. We do a little bit of arithmetic. Let's just write out what it is. Um, sorry, my two to the, okay. This two to the J everywhere, it should be two to the minus J. Nobody called me out on that because I think nobody noticed. 
2 to the minus j, not 2 to the j. So 2 to the minus jt, remember this case, this k sub i is just a dilation of a translation of the function k. So let's write out that dilation and translation explicitly. Get k 2 to the jt minus 1x minus v. Then we get this Haar coefficient, which we have another 2 to the minus jt minus 1 half because h is dilated, it's a dilated half function in the same way. And translated 2 to the j t to the minus 1 y at minus v, f y, dy, dv. You can be a bit slower in this computation. I'm just pulling the result out of nowhere. You can see for yourself, yeah, this looks right. And we write that as an integral over r of a function. So let's combine these two factors here to get two to the minus j to the t to the minus one. We'll have an integral over r of this function k times the half function dv fy dy. So what we're getting here is already some convolution applied to f. We just, this thing in the square brackets is the convolving function. We just need to be more explicit about what that actually is. This is all just straightforward computation. We do a change of variables in that term. Let's just only look at this term because that's all that matters now. Two to the minus j, t to the minus one, k of two to the minus j, t minus one, x minus y plus u, h of u, du. So it's doing a change of variables, calling this thing here u and rearranging everything. It works, I hope. Uh, anytime I do any kind of integral computation, I could have made a mistake. So keep your eyes open for them. I think this is correct. So if you remember the definition of phi k, this is phi k. k of something plus u, h of u, du. It's phi k dilated by two to the minus jt in L1 sense, because I have this one on two to the minus jt. I've got that there of x minus y. Right, so this thing above here, that is a convolution. It's something x minus y, f y, d y, that's a convolution. So when we look at the full operator, or at least oh, we're not looking at the full operator yet, sorry. Let's just summarize what we proved. This part of the average dyadic shift where you only average over omega and you look at a fixed scale, this is phi k dilated by two to the minus jt convolved with f at x. And then you sum, actually, I'm not going to write sum. Just... Therefore, the average dyadic shift that we're working with is the integral from one to two, the sum over scales from m to n of this convolution. I'm not having an x here, let's just write it like this. D nu t. And the last step is just to write this integral over, integral from one to two, sum from j is going from m to n, and we have two to the minus j t. So really we're just summing from two to the minus n t, uh, two to the minus n to two to the minus m. If I'm playing my cards right, I'm not, it's a slight mistake in what I've written. This is an integral from two to the minus n, to two to the minus m, do I want plus one here? What's the largest number I can get here? Yeah, I think that should be plus one <laughs> because there's this integral from one to two happening here. I'm really bad at this kind of math. Anyway, so we have phi k t convolved with f d nu tilde t because nu tilde was just the multiplicative extension of nu. That's how this measure works. Does this look right to everybody that particular this two to the minus m plus one because I'm integrating to two and the largest value I can have here is two to the minus m. So I have a two to the minus m times two. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. 
it's wrong in my notes. And it's, yeah, I'll have to fix that. So that's done if we make the appropriate correction up here. All right. So what this says now is from this point on, we can forget about shifted dyadic systems, thankfully. <laughs> now we just need to look at these admissible base functions K. We need to look at the functions phi K that come from that. And we need to just compute these things, compute what these convolution operators actually are and hope that we get the truncated Hilbert transforms. So as an immediate corollary of this proposition, Let's set up all our usual assumptions, x, u, and d, p, 1, infinity, k is an admissible base function uh, with phi k as above. So phi k is just integral of k x plus u, h, x, d, x, hang on, d, u, or whatever. I can't remember. What's phi? k x plus u, h, u, d, u. Okay. I better write that down if I can't remember it. That's fine, okay. For all m less than or equal to n, these are integers. We have two estimates that we're going to use. This is the first. We take this convolution operator that appears and we take dt on t. So this is a particular choice of nu. In LP, that's bounded uniformly in M and N by the LP norm of F. The second corollary, which has a different choice of measure and uses a slightly different estimate that we're going to use later on, not for the Hilbert transform, is that the Rademacher average where you sum from M to N, epsilon J, phi, oops, I've written phi J, that should be K, phi K, two to the minus J convolved with F in LP. That's also bounded by the LP norm of F. So this first estimate, we're going to use that in the bound of the Hilbert transform because this operator here is actually going to be pretty much a truncated Hilbert transform. You can't see it from this representation, but it is. The second one is going to be used for the, the Michelin multiplier theorem. And if you know harmonic analysis, you should already be looking at this and saying this is basically a Littlewood Paley inequality, if you know Littlewood Paley theory. Because these guys here, these are the Littlewood Paley. Um, operators, if you want to call them that, they're essentially Fourier projections onto dyadic intervals. This is all if you already know little of Paley theory. We're going to do this later on more explicitly, so don't worry if you haven't seen it. I don't really need to write out the full proof because we've already said everything we need to do. Part one, you take the probability measure nu to be dt on t. This is on the interval from one to two. The problem is that's not a probability measure, but it is a finite measure. You just have to normalize it by log two, because log two is the integral from one to two dt on t, if I've computed that right. The second you take nu to be the Dirac delta supported at the point of one. These are both probability measures on the interval one to two. You put that in when you're defining the shift operators and the average shifts, you get that these shift operators actually equal this integral you plug in the particular choice of integral and you use that the shift operators are bounded. The average shift operators are bounded, I mean. And that's it, it's done. So in this last 25 minutes, I hope it'll only take the 25 minutes, we're gonna do the Hilbert transform, finally. It only took us, um, what's it been, nine weeks? <laughs> Don't know. So we take the function k as before, square root two, half function from zero to one half minus half function from one half to one. And we can write this as the characteristic function on zero to one quarter union three quarters to one minus the characteristic function from one quarter to three quarters. 
Um, I drew it before, it looks like this. This is one quarter, three quarters, value one here. As I was saying before, you can think of this as discrete cosine, if you like. The half function itself is like discrete sine. So you imagine sine cosine, all right? And the Hilbert transform sends sine to cosine if you compute things properly. So this is a bit of a clue as to why you take this function because this function is taking discrete sine to discrete cosine, at least locally, you know, localized on intervals. So it's a plausible discrete model for a Hilbert transform taking the, the dyadic shift operators with this admissible base function. The miracle is that that actually works. <laughs> it sounds like it's too simple to work, but it turns out it does. So you take that choice of K and you need to define your function phi. So this phi superscript K from before, which is the integral of K X plus U, H of U, DU. And whenever I see such an integral and I have to compute it explicitly, I get scared because I'm really bad at any concrete computations, but it's not an exceptionally difficult one. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's, it's very concrete. What this function looks like is, so let's take zero, one, minus one, one quarter, et cetera. This is grid size one quarter. This is value one minus one. It starts at zero, goes to minus, Okay, that's not one, it's minus three quarters. Goes back to zero, then goes to one quarter, then goes down to one, and then it is zero. So it looks like this on the right. It's, it's linear between those points. It's piecewise linear. And the function's odd. So on the other half of the real line, it just does the inverse of that. The negative of that, that's your function phi sub k phi superscript k. I'm not going to do the explicit computation here because I'm bound to get it wrong. You're welcome to do it yourself. But we don't actually need to know exactly what phi superscript k is. The only important features we need is that it's odd. It's supported on the interval from minus one to one. And the integral from zero to one of this function is minus one on eight. In fact, all we need is that that integral is non-zero. Minus one on eight is quite non-zero, does the job. By the way, if you want to try to find optimal constants in all of these inequalities, you have to find an optimal choice of K to do this. This isn't optimal, <laughs> but it works, yeah. So let's prove bounds for the truncated Hilbert transforms. So just to remind ourselves, this truncated Hilbert transform of F is the integral, oh, I've got one on pi, that doesn't matter. Y from epsilon to capital epsilon in absolute value, F of X minus Y, dy on Y. These are truncated Hilbert transforms. As I said on Tuesday, these are actually bounded on LP without any additional information but we want uniform bounds that don't depend on the epsilons, right? So that we can take the limits as epsilon and capital epsilon go to zero and infinity, recover the Hilbert transform, there you go, everything's done. We just need to get bounds for that. We need to show this bound here. This is what we need. That's enough to get bounds for the actual Hilbert transform itself as a limit as epsilon goes to zero, capital epsilon goes to infinity. X is UMD, P is between one and infinity, of course. Let's consider this operator. Consider the operator, it's an integral from epsilon to capital epsilon of phi sub T convolved with F DT on T. Let's evaluate it at X where we take the phi from above, this phi here, phi superscript k. This is our candidate for the truncated Hilbert transform in the end, this operator here. It's not, but it's close enough. We write it out as an integral over R, so writing out the convolution, do a bit of Fabini, put the epsilon integral on the inside, 
write it out explicitly is phi of y on t dt on t squared because we have a one on t factor from the dilation and a one on t factor from the measure times f of x minus y dy and we simplify this guy down well we don't so much we make it more complex we don't simplify it we make we complexify it and then that helps us <laughs> This is a nice technique that comes up all the time. You're looking at an integral of a function. You say that's actually the difference of the primitive of the function. So we take capital phi of y minus epsilon minus capital phi of y on big epsilon. Sorry, small epsilon, big epsilon divided by y. I'll say in a moment what capital phi is. Capital phi of x is the integral from zero to x of phi of s ds. It's the primitive of phi, it's lowercase phi. You do the calculus, you see that these things are equal. Fundamental theorem of calculus, right? So what do we know about phi, capital phi? Because what we know about lowercase phi is that it's odd. So capital phi is even and capital phi of y is actually equal to minus one on eight for all y such that absolute value of y is greater than or equal to one. This is because lowercase phi is odd. As I said, it's supported from minus one to one. The integral from zero to one is minus one on eight. And that tells you that this primitive is equal to minus one on eight for all y outside that interval from minus one to one. And that's pretty much all we need to know about capital phi. <coughs> what this tells us is that capital phi of y on epsilon on y, let's rewrite that cleverly as one on epsilon, epsilon on y. Capital phi of y on epsilon restricted to the interval minus one to one of y on epsilon. And then we have the restriction to values outside that interval and all of those values are minus one on eight. So we get minus one on eight, characteristic function of the real line minus that interval, y on epsilon. And what you see here, with that one on y here, <coughs> this is the kernel of the truncated Hilbert transform. Miracle, all right? So we write this as psi sub epsilon of y. I'll say what that is, minus one on eight y, characteristic function from epsilon to infinity of absolute value of y, doing the changes of variables. Where phi sub, well, phi sub epsilon is just the epsilon dilation, L1 normalized. Psi of x is x to the minus one, capital phi of x, restricted to minus one to one. So if you dilate that by epsilon and you plug in y, you get this term here with the, what do I need here? What am I missing? I need an epsilon and y and there we go. Am I missing any terms here? Oh no, this is all good, yep. This x to the minus one helps here. This is the epsilon dilation. This is the x to the minus one. Yeah, okay, cool. All good. So what we actually need to look at is capital phi of y on epsilon minus capital phi of y on capital epsilon. We can write this as psi sub epsilon of y minus psi sub capital epsilon of y minus one on eight y characteristic function from epsilon to capital epsilon of y, uh, absolute value of y. And now we really here have the kernel of, well, not actually the, the truncated Hilbert transform, but pi on eight times the truncated Hilbert transform, because we have that one on pi out the front of the Hilbert transform. It's a convolution against one on y restricted to this set here. Yeah. So what all of that tells us finally, because what we've managed to compute before was that this operator up here 
is actually the convolution of f against this kernel. So when we notice that this kernel is actually given as this sum, we can say, all right, minus pi on eight times the truncated Hilbert transform of f is actually, we can write, we would have a, what we have is an integral from epsilon to capital epsilon e, but we actually don't know how to bound these convolutions. We only know how to bound these integrals of convolutions when you're integrating from one power of two to another power of two. And we need all epsilons and capital epsilons here. So let's just write out two to the floor of log two epsilon, small epsilon, up to two to the floor of log two capital epsilon. Take the nearest dyadic powers we can find that we know how to bound. We'll have an error term here. So what's missing is two to the log two epsilon, well, capital epsilon up to epsilon minus two to the floor log two small epsilon up to small epsilon phi t convolved with f. So that's just to compensate for the fact that we have to take integrals over dyadic powers. And then we have a few more terms. We have minus psi sub epsilon convolved with f plus psi sub capital epsilon convolved with f. This is the representation of the truncated Hilbert transform implicitly in terms of average dyadic shift operators. These are these guys and also this minus some error terms that turn out to be small. Now we know this is bounded, this term here. On LP, uniformly in epsilon and capital epsilon. So we can forget about that first term. That first term is all good. We're just left with these error terms. The way to deal with the error terms, you deal with them all in the same way, basically. Let's deal with the error terms. Firstly, we just say, okay, phi, this phi that appears here, phi is bounded. And it's also supported on the interval from minus one to one. Okay, we know exactly what phi is, but we're not gonna use all the properties of phi. We're just gonna use it as bounded and supported on that interval. So if you take the convolution of phi t with f and evaluate it at x and you look at the norm of that in the bionic space x, this is less than or equal to t to the minus one integral over r, put the norm inside the integral, phi of y on t, f of x minus y normed. This is just writing out the convolution and putting the norm on the inside. That's bounded by t to the minus one uh, because phi is, this is, phi is bounded and supported on the unit interval. So actually up to a constant, it's bounded by the characteristic function of that interval in norm, in absolute value, I should say. So we have that. And this is actually an average from x minus one to x plus one of the norm of f of y dy, if you change the variables. It's an average over a ball centered at x. So what's that? That's bounded by the hardy littlewood maximal function of the norm of f evaluated at x. hardy littlewood maximal function. Um, okay, some people have done harmonic analysis, some people have not. If you haven't done harmonic analysis, this is like the Dube maximal function, which we showed was bounded. This m of f at x is the supremum over all balls centered at x of the average of the norm of f on that ball. What we have here is one particular average. So that's bounded by the supremum over all averages. Let's just write that explicitly here. Supremum over all r greater than zero average of x minus r to x plus r, f y dy. And this is the definition of that maximal function there, in case you haven't seen it before, but I assume most of you have. So using that, we can bound this first error term. So we have the integral from, what is it? Two to the floor of log two e up to e 
minus two to the floor of log two epsilon, epsilon phi t convolved with f dt on t. We want to estimate this first error term in LP and show that it's bounded by the norm of f. We just pull out the integrals. Sorry for the mess, let me write it a little bit neater. Then we have the norm of what's on the inside, but we know that that's bounded by the maximal operator of f in LP. This is now a scalar valued function because I'm actually taking the maximal function of the norm function of f, which is a scalar valued function. These integrals, we, we know that two to the floor of log two e is actually within a factor two of e. Uh, no, sorry, these two things are within a factor two of each other. And the same here. And sorry, this is all dt on t. Actually, I can put the dt on t here. And I should probably put absolute values everywhere to make that proper. So because both of these integrals, so dt on t has this nice multiplicative invariance, so you can shift this interval from two to the floor log two e, e to one to something else. That something else is just the ratio of e to two to the log two e, and this is less than two. So the, both of these integrals are actually less than log two. That's what I wanted to say in the end there. Two log two, and the maximal operator is bounded on LP. This is the hardy little maximal theorem. So let's put in a constant depending on P and say that's bounded by the LP norm of F. No Barnack space assumptions there. That's a scalar valued result. This constant two log two doesn't matter. We can absorb that into the implicit constant. So this first error term, this one here, that's bounded by the LP norm of F. And we're just left with this one. The exact same argument works. <laughs> I don't need to say anything different about that because the fun, we, all we use here is that phi was bounded and supported on this interval. The same is true, psi. So we bound it by the hardy little maximal function of f, except this time we don't even need to integrate in t. That maximal function estimate here that you get, <coughs> you've got, sorry, I just realized a mistake. This is on x plus one, this is x t, not one. Yeah, the same works for the Psi. You'll have averages over balls of radius epsilon or capital epsilon instead of T like you did here, bound by the maximal operator that's bounded by the norm of F. So the same is true for the other error terms. And in the end you get that the truncated Hilbert transform of F is less than or equal to a constant times the LP norm of F and we're done. And as I said on Tuesday, that lets you take the limit in the truncation parameters epsilon because you've got these uniform bounds and it lets you deduce that the Hilbert transform initially defined on scalar valued LP has a bounded X valued extension when P is between one and infinity and X is UMD, which is Burkholder's theorem, one of Burkholder's theorems. Okay, I think that's it. It's a nice proof. It's two lectures long, but it's a nice proof. There's quite a lot that can be said about that proof just to, to reiterate what the key idea is. The key idea is to build operators that have the right translation and dilation invariants because these invariances actually characterize the Hilbert transform up to a scalar multiple. And okay, we dealt with truncated Hilbert transforms, but that says looking for these invariances is kind of the, the clue as to how to build operators. And the only operators that we really know how to bound on UMD spaces at first are Martingale transforms or we can get things like hard decompositions and get these Burkholder type estimates with Rademacher averages. So we need to build operators we can get out of that. These shift operators come from that. So they're not actually, they're not directly Martingale transforms, but they're pretty clearly related to Martingale transforms. You get the boundedness of them basically for free from the UMD property. 
and then you average them over all of the, the symmetries that you've got that you want to be invariant under. And if you do that averaging in the right way, then you will get a bounded operator which has the same symmetries as the Hilbert transform. So that operator, morally speaking, should be the Hilbert transform. Of course, we're sort of truncating everything, so it doesn't quite have the dilation symmetry it's supposed to have, but it pretty much has it. Morally speaking, it does in the limit as all of the truncation parameters go to zero and infinity, or as m goes to minus infinity and n goes to infinity in the truncated dyadic shifts. So then it's just a matter of taking that operator and explicitly computing what it is as a convolution operator and saying, yeah, this is the truncated Hilbert transform minus an error term. Then you just bound the error terms, standard argument. That's how it all works. Um, this argument of using random dyadic systems that we use here, this is quite a powerful argument. It's been used in a lot of areas of harmonic analysis. It's been used for what was called the A2 conjecture, which is for sharp weighted estimates of Calder and Zygmunt operators. And the Hilbert transform is just the easiest one of them. So the reason I wanted to show this argument is not just that you can get bounds for the Hilbert transform, but this the core of this argument actually can be used to prove more powerful things as well. And it's an important argument. So it's good to have seen it. Um, I think I've rambled on enough about that proof. Are there any questions about it? Well, I have no question, but I can ramble even more. <laughs> uh, I can't quite hear you. You're too far away from your microphone. Ah, so I said I have no question, but I can ramble more. Am I now close enough? To that would be good. We've got time for it. Uh, if you can go back to the place where you have the sine and cosine. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that um, <coughs> the main, uh, you, one of the main points here of having these two functions is parity again. So as you mentioned, you want oddness of this uh, convolution mm. function here. So what you need, you need an even and an odd function. So your cosine is even and your half function is odd. Of course, they're not even odd about the origin, but about the point a half. Yeah. That's okay because the way you write down this convolution here, it allows you to shift both of these functions simultaneously to the left. Yeah, this con this thing here, that's not a real convolution. This that's one. right, it's the yeah. anti-convolution, that's right. Yeah, that's what it is, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you could naively wonder whether you can do, because you're using three half functions, right, to do, uh, to build up these two functions. One is just a half function, the other one is a linear combination of yeah. two half functions. You could wonder whether you can do less, mm -hmm. but you can't because if you take two half functions, you have two odd functions and you can never convolve into an odd function, you always mm -hmm. convolve into an even function. So this remind me, I was wondering what's the source you took here? I, so I just slightly modified the proof in the analysis in Barnack Space's book. That is apparently taken, well, that's apparently modified from the proof by Pedimical and somebody That's else. right. I was just, uh, yeah, while Pereira? you were speaking, it was quickly Pedimical. pulling up yeah. the, the, the PhD thesis, actually, of Stephanie Pitt. Yeah, this comes from her stuff, yeah. In fact, I think she has an operator she calls the the Sha operator. Sha, Sha is Russian a Russian Sha. letter yeah. with lots of wiggles. <laughs> it kind of reminds, <laughs> <laughs> it reminds of these half functions here. Yeah. So. And yes, and as you mentioned, she was mainly interested in some sharp bounds. Yeah, so uh, she proved the A2 conjecture for the Hilbert transform right. by, by representing yeah. the Hilbert transform through these half shift operators. But she didn't use random dyadic systems, I don't think. That no, she had a more, she, she did something. No, she didn't. I mean, we were talking about these random systems last time where you have this really subtle way of averaging your uh, non compact and non-finite measure group. Mm. I think she did a more uh, hands-on approach. In the end yeah. of the day, she also averaged, but not using your sophisticated uh, scheme here. Yeah. Um, so the thing is, when you do these, I uh, just want to get to another point, when you do like these um, dyadic operators, uh, you can often do an induction on scales and really prove sharp bounds with sharp mm. constants and so on, right? And that's yeah. why they were writing the, the bilinear Hilbert transform yeah. as superposition. And yeah. then they tried very hard to do the same thing with the Berling transform, yeah, which is manage. very much yeah. like the uh, Hilbert transform, but in two dimensions where you convolve with one over Z. I, I keep forgetting it's one over Z or one over Z squared. 
Uh, and they are actually, it's a big famous yeah. open problem to really get the sharp bounds. So I'm yeah. talking the LP bounds with the actual correct constant. In P. Now yeah. on L2, the constant is trivial because if you do any kind of Fourier series, L2 series is multiplier bounded by one, constant one. Mm -hmm. But in LP, the constant is not one. And it's a big open problem. Ah, this is the, I don't know much about this problem. Zoe told me about this problem because her master's thesis was on that. But let me, I'm just referring to Zoe Nierat who defended her yes, yes, thesis yes, yesterday yes. for the students. <laughs> Good. Um, your Berling Alphors operator, B. I forget the definition. <laughs> yes, good, yeah. Building alpha's operator on what is it, an LP of C. So you're really on the complex plane. Exactly. And the conjecture is that the LP norm of that is bounded by, uh, I know the constant because this constant is actually quite important. Max of P, P prime. Um, Two max p p prime minus no max p p prime minus one, yeah. Um, the reason this is the constant, and the reason I know this constant is because this constant is the UMD p constant of C. <laughs> the second version of yes. the Berling Alfors conjecture is that when you extend that to Barnack valued functions, the optimal norm is the LP UMD constant of X. <laughs> That's why I know that. Okay. Uh, it seems yeah. like a coincidence that the optimal, well, the conjectured optimal constant for the Berling Alfors operator is actually the UMD constant, exactly, of the uh, space C. Yeah. Yeah, it's curious. Yeah. The constant it doesn't look so complicated. So there could be this number could come up two different ways independently. Yeah. But of course, it could also be deeply related. It is, uh, yeah. of course, we are all talking. Uh, and I think the best that's known for everybody is this with a two out the front. I think it's this is known. Yeah, even in the vector valid the case. Time, yeah, it, the two has been improved, I believe, ah, okay. something like one point six or so. Uh, Banuelos may have the uh, world. Ah, yeah, you're right. I forgot about that. Uh, and so I think it is believed they have tried all kind of superpositions the way we have seen above. Of course, in two D with two dimensional half functions and very sophisticated ways of doing it. Banuelos uses half functions relative to uh, not a square grid, but a rectangular grid by which the horizontal and the vertical, or was it even Wahlberg, hmm. Peter, Michael, where there's a ratio of square root two between the horizontal. I don't know. And the I honestly don't know much about this operator. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the, so they have tried, but I believe so the world records may be done or close to world using these techniques. Yeah. Maybe it's believed that in the end of the day, because that's an important operator and complex analysis, maybe yeah. you have to do some complex miracles to really get the sharp constant. You probably do. It seems yeah. to be always a loss when you do this. Of course, when you average operators, the danger is that the average operator is a little better behaved than the original things you yeah. were averaging. And so if you are after the sharp constant, then you may have the sharp constant of all these ha uh, operators and you yeah. may just not be the one you need for the yeah. continuous. <laughs> but but at least for Calderon Zygmunt operators and the Hilbert transform and things like that, this method is sharp when you do it properly. I mean, this you have to extend well, it's, it's this sharp. method to do more than operators. But... It's sharp in terms of, I believe, growth and P and things like in that. In some sense, it's sharp. But yes. I'm not sure you're really getting, if you really want the actual number here and, and worry within mm. the fact. Then it's a different story, yeah. Then that's a different story. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very interesting story and a very famous. So this, it seems like an innocent problem asking for the sharp constant, but it has. Yeah. Uh, let me give one little open problem, actually, speaking of these things. If you take this proof that I just did for the Hilbert transform and you track everything carefully, then the LP norm of the Hilbert transform is bounded by uh, some constant that doesn't depend on P or X. You get the UMD P constant of X squared. You get a squared, like a kind of square dependence in the UMD constant. The conjecture is that it's actually less than or equal to the UMD P constant with no square. When you do this properly, you actually get the UMD property being used twice. <laughs> so you get twice the UMD constant. No, but, I thought, yeah. are you sure? I thought for the Hilbert transform, the sharp constant is known, but I may be mistaken. Sharp constants are known where you take weighted estimates and you have sharp dependence in the weight. Uh, no, but, there's some 
vector valid extensions are still it's not quite known how sharp this oh, is. Oh, vector valid extensions. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. If x is scalar, then you know all this thing, but not if x yeah. is vector valid. Now the yeah. thing that's sharp is that the when you take the Hilbert transform on a weighted LP space. Yeah, yeah. Then that norm is what the at least in L2, I forget what happens for LP, but no, but if, if the weight is just the standard weight one, yep. then you actually know the the actual number in the bound in all LP. Ah, yeah, yeah, by the Picaridis theorem. The, the, <laughs> I was going to say the Greek guy, right? I actually so, know his name, yeah. <laughs> he has a Greek sounding name. Okay, yes, I know. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I remember this number, Picaridis. It's called the Picaridis number, yeah. But that's an old uh, scale. The LP norm of Hilbert transform scalar valid is what is it cot two pi on p <laughs> something like that. Oh, that sounds something like, like that. Correct. It's in analysis in binary spaces. That's how I remember it. It's something like that. The thing is that the exact constant where you take the x valued extension is not known. Only for the Absolutely. scalar valued case yeah, and the Hilbert valued case, that exact number is correct. It's cot two pi p something. Yeah. Don't take that literally. It's probably wrong. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I'm glad you confirmed that. Your source goes back to Peter Michel as well. I remember. Yeah, it's a combination of the Peter Michel argument and Thomas Hüttonen's A2 proof. That was sort of the uh, people talking about her thesis were pointing at this discovery here. I mean, she has other discoveries actually in that thesis, yeah. but that's the yeah. one that's easy, easy to say. And this comment about even and odd was precisely at the yeah. time she was the one saying, you guys might try with two half functions, but you need three because <laughs> to yeah. get something odd. In fact, one different. other thing is that this argument of using Ha representations to bound Keller and Zygmunt operators in the Barnack valued setting, that goes back to Figiel actually in the late okay. 80s, I think. So that's even older. Yeah. That's older. Yeah. yeah. Figiel, but Peter Mikkel obviously took some inspiration from that and like really yeah. sharpened it. For it, it, looked like it yeah. yeah. It looked like. I mean, in, the, in retrospect, it looks innocent, but you have to have the idea first. So yeah, it's a fairly deep idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. very good. Yes. Cool. We've gone over time enough. Are there any other questions? All right. Uh, Alex? Yep. Uh, so just, I was just wondering, like the functions phi k, which you defined earlier. Yep. So are they like in the Fourier analysis setup, are they in some sense correspond to the Dirichlet kernels or the Poisson kernels? This particular one or in general? Uh, no, I mean the way you are using these functions to you know get results about the Hilbert transform and stuff uh, like that. Um, I, I, I mean, guess there is some analogy. Like it's it's the analogy is that I guess they're they're both convolution kernels. So this op, all of these operators are convolution operators with some kernel. And yeah. So it's it's just another kernel. Yeah. I don't think there's any particular relation with say Poisson or Dirichlet. They're, what they have in common is that they're integral kernels. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. Okay. So like your Hilbert transform is a where did I write the truncated Hilbert transform? Is already as it's already an integral operator, but the kernel is one on y times the characteristic function of this set times one on pi. So it's it's a convolution nice. operator. So the whole th game here is to take these dyadic shift operators, which are not obviously convolution operators, and at least when you average them out over the translation parameter, they become convolution operators. So then you have to compare the kernel that you get with the kernel that you want. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. This happens a lot in harmonic analysis. Like you get some operator, you notice that it's a convolution operator. You compute the kernel, and then you do as much as possible with that kernel. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, I'll stop recording. You're free to go and so on.